Many of you know my wife, Libby. We've been married almost 23 years. Um, what many of you don't know is that she was not my first love. Um, in the sixth grade, I was enamored with a little blue-eyed, blonde-haired girl who was unfortunately not as enamored with me. In the sixth grade, I was the ball boy for the high school football team, me and my friend, meaning that we traded out footballs with the referee. You know, you just ran down the sideline. If they wanted a ball, you switched them out. And so we got to wear a pair of gold Bulldogs jersey, and we thought we were big stuff. My dream was to be the next Lawrence Dodd. Lawrence Dodd was our quarterback on this really good football team that we had. Lawrence is now brain surgeon. I wanted to be Lawrence Dodd, tall, handsome, you know. So I'm out there with my buddy, and we're warming up before the game because that's what ball boys do. You warm up like you're part of the football team, right? They're out there warming up. So you warm up, and you're throwing the ball around. You're scoring make-believe touchdowns. And out of the corner of my eye, I can see the little blue-eyed, blonde-haired girl walk through the gate. So it was time to impress her. Already had the jersey. My hair parted down the middle and feathered back perfectly. So I take off running and I hold up my hand as if to say to my friend, throw me the ball. And so he throws me the ball and it's lofted perfectly and I'm about to run under it and make an impressive catch. Do you remember before they started painting the numbers on the field, they had those plastic <laughs> yard markers? Remember those? Every 10 yards they would have a plastic yard marker. Well, as I was about to make the catch, I tripped on one of those. And I only stopped rolling when I hit the referee who was standing at midfield waiting for the game to start. Little did I know, not only did the little blue-eyed, blonde-haired girl see that, so did everybody in the entire stadium. As they erupted in laughter and cheers as I stood up. You know, there's no trees on a football field. You can't hide behind anything. I don't know why I told you that story. Uh, why would somebody tell you that? No, actually, my point is that I had strong faith in a weak Savior. Does that make sense? I had no doubt in my abilities at that moment. When I was trying to impress that young lady, I felt confident in myself. But people make weak saviors, don't they? And that's something that we see here, at least in the beginning of Mark chapter 9. Starting in verse 14, here's what we read. It says, when they came back to the disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and some scribes arguing with them. Immediately, when the entire crowd saw him, they were amazed and began running up to greet him. And he asked them, what are you discussing with them? And one of the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought you my son possessed with the spirit which makes him mute and whenever it seizes him it slams him to the ground and he foams at the mouth and he grinds his teeth and he stiffens out I told your disciples to cast it out and they they could not do it and he answered them and said oh unbelieving generation how long shall I be with you how long shall I put up with you bring him to me they brought the boy to him when he saw him, immediately the spirit threw him into a convulsion, and falling to the ground, he began rolling around and foaming at the mouth. And he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. It has often thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if I can... All things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the boy's father cried out and said, I do believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was rapidly gathering, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You deaf and mute spirit, I command you, come out of him and do not enter him again. After crying out and throwing him into terrible convulsions, it came out. And the boy became so much like a corpse that most of them said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and raised him, and he got up. When he came into the house, his disciples began questioning him privately. Why could we not drive it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot come out by anything 
but prayer. Faith is only as strong as the object you're trusting in. You realize that? Did the apostles trust in their own ability too much? I don't know. Kind of seems that way, doesn't it? Is that where it all went wrong? After Jesus steps in and does what the disciples could not do, they ask him, what did we do wrong? And Jesus essentially says, you have strong faith in a weak Savior. The apostles had been equipped with power from their Lord, and yet they had failed to nurture that power, it seems. Because notice the answer. Jesus says, this kind cannot come out by anything but prayer. You know, God, gave, God may give you a talent or an ability, but if you don't include God in that talent or that ability, it's left powerless. A preacher can be dynamic, he can be vibrant, he can be very interesting to listen to, he can be a great orator. But if, if he doesn't nurture that ability, that power that has been given to him by God, if he doesn't foster that personal relationship, that intimate relationship with God, if he doesn't study his Bible regularly, if he doesn't develop that talent and that ability by including God in the equation, then he's never going to be as great as he can be. That power is not going to be with him. He can be a brilliant wordsmith. He may be creative. He may be easy to listen to. But he's never going to have the best power and ability that he could have because he's not connected to the source. It's easy to thank God for the blessing and take the blessing from him and yet forget the blesser. It's easy to exclude him from the equation. The apostles experienced a power outage because the object of their faith was misplaced. Maybe they, they came across the situation and just felt that they could handle it on their own. Maybe they felt that the power lied within them, and so therefore they could take care of it. What did they find out, though, is that they make terrible saviors. They may have all the faith in the world, but they had a strong faith in a weak savior. Notice what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 6 and following. He says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So then, neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. Paul says, in essence, this isn't about me. This has nothing to do with me. This is all about God. I've been given an ability, I've been given, given a talent and an opportunity by God, and I wouldn't be here if it weren't for him. Notice he says that, that he plants. He says, you're God's field, you're God's building. Paul said, I can work the land, but there would be no crop without God. I can build a structure, but it's not going to stand without God. And we as Christians can use our gifts and our talents and our abilities in a positive and meaningful way. But power resides in God, not us. It's not us alone that accomplishes anything. It's where we place our faith. You see, the apostles didn't have a faith problem. They had a place problem. That's the lesson for all of us. It's not about what we can accomplish for God. It's about what God can accomplish through us. The Father comes seeking Jesus. But Jesus is away on the mountaintop, and so he settles for the next best thing, right? For his apostles. But his apostles are unable to drive out this demon that is causing his son so many issues. And in turn causing the father so many issues. Can you imagine the father in that situation? Hearing that Jesus is near. Going to him thinking that finally, finally I'm going to have some resolve here. I don't have to watch my son suffer any longer. And can you imagine the disappointment that he felt when Jesus wasn't around? But hey, next best thing, plan B, the apostles. They can do this. They've been with Jesus. They know his power. They have that power. Can you imagine his disappointment and his frustration when that didn't work? It's no wonder the father is left frustrated and hopeless. And he says, I believe, help my unbelief. You would probably do the same thing. Imagine having to watch your son day in and day out dealing with this demon that causes him to foam at the mouth and convulse and, and has almost killed him many times, thinking that every time this happens, it could be the last time. 
We don't like to see our kids sick. We don't so much as like to see our kids suffer with strep or the, uh, a common cold, much less something like this. Can you imagine? It's no wonder the father was dealing and struggling with doubt. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Have you been there? You ever been there? Can you recite the words of this father? Have there been times in your life where you've struggled? What if I told you that I've been there? You ever watch those 30 for 30s on ESPN, those documentaries? What if I told you? That's how they always start. What if I told you that as your preacher, the guy that's supposed to have it all figured out and supposed to be above the fray, deals with doubt and struggles with some questions at times? I've been there. Just because you have faith doesn't mean that there are not gaps at times. As you try to figure it out, as you're trying to search for, for some kind of answer to the issue. I'm sure all of you in some way, shape, or form have dealt with it, and you've been in the position of that father. You say, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Kind of like John the Baptist, remember when he was sitting in a prison cell about to have his head removed from his body? His knees were knocking. He was struggling in that moment, right? And you would be too. Before you pound on John, not that you would, but if you're ever tempted to do so, if you were in that position, you'd be the same way. He just wanted some reassurance, and so what does he do? He sends messengers to Jesus to ask, are you the expected one? Or is there somebody else? In other words, in that moment, John just wanted some reassurance. He wanted Jesus to say, John, it's going to be okay. I am the expected one. That word in the Greek is erkomai. John actually used that term earlier in Matthew chapter 3 when he spoke of the one that was coming. He used that exact term. So John knew who he was talking to. He knew that Jesus was the expected one. He just needed some reassurance in that moment, right? But Jesus answers in a, in, a, in a strange, maybe unusual way. He says to the messengers, go back and tell John that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cured, the deaf hear, the, the dead are raised, the poor have the gospel preached to them. He doesn't say, yeah, go back and tell John that I am the expected one. Rest assured, I am He. He doesn't say, I am the one who walks on water. I'm the one who changes the weather. Go back and tell John, I'm the one that makes the Pharisees look like morons. Doesn't say that. No. He lists the miracles. And in essence says to the messengers, go back and tell John, consider the evidence. You know what you've seen. You know what you witnessed. You were there. You baptized me and the Holy Spirit descended on me like a dove. You know. Think about that. As you're wrestling, as you're struggling. Something else that Jesus doesn't do is he doesn't condemn John. In fact, we see in Matthew chapter 11, verse 11, he says, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. You ever felt like John? You ever felt like the Father in Mark chapter 9? You ever wrestled with your faith and found it difficult to believe sometimes? I think there's a wonderful lesson here for all of us. Several lessons, but one of them is they were honest, weren't they? John was honest. Are you the expected one? Just shoot me straight. I'm struggling right now. I need some help. The Father in Mark chapter 9 was honest. Speaking directly to Jesus, Lord, I believe, but I'll be honest with you, I have my doubts. And I don't blame him. If you dealt with that and watching your son deal with that for all his life, I think you would have the same sentiment, right? They were honest. Jesus said about John, he's still my man. Even though he had doubts, he's still my man. That's an incredible affirmation. And Jesus heals this man's son, doesn't he? At least in part, I think, so that that unbelief would be removed. Even with Thomas, Jesus doesn't condemn Thomas, does he? I think it would be great 
if every congregation of the Lord's Church had a two-word sign above the entrance that simply read, Doubters Welcome. You got questions? Come in. I've told you before, I am where I am today and stand where I am today because I had doubts and I had questions. We should value questioning. If people are trying to seek answers, we should be willing to give them answers because God's not fragile. His truth is truth. He doesn't need us to stand up for Him. Right? Are you skeptical? Come in. Are you struggling? Come on in. Are you having doubts? Please come in. Doubters, welcome. We want to help you in any way that we can to understand that God is not fragile. He can handle your questions. And as his disciples, we can help you as well. Our fears, our worries, our doubts won't upset God. He's not fragile. He can handle it. But there's a problem here. And the problem comes in because people assume, even Christians assume, that doubt is the opposite of faith. And so therefore, if you doubt, it's a sin. And because it's a sin, you'll go to hell if you don't have airtight, 100% faith. Folks, doubt is not the opposite of faith. Unbelief is the opposite of faith. Doubt's not. But the proof text for this argument is found in James chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, right? But he must ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. There it is in plain language. All doubters will be thrown into the lake of fire. Right? That's what it says. So James is saying... That doubt equals double-minded, so the Father in Mark chapter 9, John the Baptist, Thomas, were all in danger of losing their soul because they doubted. They were this close to being thrown into the lake of fire. Is that what James is saying here? Is that what he wants us to take away? No. No, it's not. Because James is talking about a plastic bottle that one minute is next to the shore and then the next is out at sea just being tossed by the waves. That's what James is talking about. Someone who's trying to be two things. That that maybe wants to believe in God over here in some ways, but yes, wants to doubt as well. Someone who won't land on anything. Someone who's just tossed to and fro. That's very different than the person who believes in God, who wants what God wants for him, but yet struggles at times. That's different. And surely we can see that difference. You see, well-meaning Christians often send the message that church is for those who have it all figured out. So if you have hesitations or reservations or frustrations, then you need to get those lined out before you come into the church building, right? Many operate under the assumption that church is for the cleaned up and the dressed up and the blessed up. But have you ever read Paul's letters to the churches? Those churches were far from cleaned up dressed up and blessed up. They had all sorts of problems. Because the truth of the matter is, church is for the broken. Church is for the messed up. Church is for those who don't have it all figured out. Because whether you admit it or not, we are all limping into truth. We all have our struggles at times. The church's mission is to make and grow disciples, right? Straight from the Bible. Our mission is to make and grow disciples. And part of that process has to include helping people understand what it means to be a child of God and thus answering those questions, helping them with their moments of doubt or frustration or reservation. Jesus doesn't tell the Father in Mark chapter 9 to get lost and come back when you've got it figured out. He doesn't do that. He doesn't condemn John. He doesn't blast Thomas. In fact, the only people that he condemns that we see in Scripture are those who had it all figured out, or at least they thought, and refused to believe any different. You see, doubt can be a wonderful opportunity. There is benefit in the doubt. Paul said to examine or prove everything carefully. Why do you think he said that? Examine or prove everything carefully. Why do you think he said that? 
Maybe because he knew that we all have questions or doubts. Also because he knew that false teachers were going to come in and try to dismantle everything that he said and persuade people, tempting them to buy into something that was erroneous. But you win the bout with doubt by examining everything. Examine everything. Prove it. Go back to the standard. If you're going to examine something, you have to examine it based on the standard of what is right. When I was teaching school, I would grade test, and I would have an answer key, and I would have the student's paper there side by side. And I would go down, and if there was a wrong answer, guess who was wrong? Not the answer key, at least not typically. The student's test, whatever the question was. If it didn't match up with the answer key, that, that was wrong because the answer key was the standard. We have a standard. And you've got to go back to the standard. If you want to win the bout with doubt, you've got to go back to the standard. You've got to keep going back to what is true. That's it. Return to true north. Go back to the compass. Understand what is right. That's how we win the bout with doubt. Romans chapter 8, Paul writes, For I am convinced... For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul was convinced. And because Paul was convinced, because he was persuaded, nothing was going to separate him from the love of God. In 2 Timothy 1 and 12, Paul tells Timothy, I know whom I have believed. I know who I'm, I, whom I have believed. Some things you think, some things you speculate about, some things you hope for, and some things you just know. In times of struggling, keep going back to what you know to be true. You know, for me, I have a handful of convictions that you're never going to convince me otherwise on. Now, as I get older, my list of essentials starts to shrink. Isn't that right with all of us pretty much? As you get older, your list of essentials starts to shrink. There are some things that at 25 I would have, I would have died on a hill for that I won't today. There are some swords I would have fallen on 20 years ago that I won't today. My list of essentials over the years has shrunk. But let me tell you something, folks. I've still got a list. I've still got a list. I believe in the sanctity of human life, and I believe abortion is disgusting and terrible and immoral and horrible, and we should be thankful that God hasn't destroyed us all because of it. I believe firmly in God's plan for human sexuality, one man, one woman for life. I believe in that. That's, that's on my essentials list. Here's some other things. God is love. Jesus is Lord. The Bible is the authority. You're not going to convince me otherwise of those things. I am convinced of these things. No ifs, ands, or buts. They form the basis of my faith. So when I struggle, I return to what I know. And I remember this one undeniable truth. He is God and I am not, right? Here's something else that goes along with that. Act on your faith, not your doubt. Doubt is not a sin, but how you handle your doubt can lead to sin. If you don't handle your doubt effectively, it can pull you away from God. And obviously, that's not good, right? It's okay to have questions and uncertainties. What's not okay is to allow those questions and uncertainties to be answered by one who is not the standard. Make sense? I may have shared this with you before, but I told, I told Zane and Zoe before she went off to college, of course, Zane will be going in the fall, I told them that you're about to go off to school, and I'll be at a Christian school, but still, you're going to go to a school where your world is going to be completely opened. And you're going to have friends that are more left-leaning. You're going to have friends that are more right-leaning. You're going to have friends that don't believe at all. You're going to hear from professors that say things that make your ears perk up and go, well, now, wait a minute, I've never heard it like that. And I told him, I believe all that's good. I really do. I believe all that's good. Because it's going to happen sooner or later, right? But here's what's not good. Giving your doubt a courtesy that you won't give your faith. When there's something questionable, you return to the compass. You examine your doubts. 
and you put them to the test. What happens all too often is we examine our faith and put it to the test and, and try to find excuses or reasons for believing our doubts. So we give our doubt a courtesy that we're not willing to give our faith. If you're going to be critical about this, if you're going to be a true thinker and open-minded, you've got to examine against the standard. What is the standard? I have a good friend that's a preacher that sat in on a seminar recently, and the seminar was over women's role in the church. And the teacher stood up there, the professor, and said, Paul was wrong in these passages. Just blatantly said it. The Timothy passage, the, the Corinthians passage, Paul was wrong. And my friend raised his hand and he said, so who do we follow, you? I mean, who do we follow? Some professor that has it all figured out or the God-breathed scriptures? Because I don't know about you, but I don't care how difficult it is, I'm following the Holy Spirit-inspired Word of God, even if it's tough. There are some things that I wish were a little easier to understand there are some things that maybe I wish God would have said it differently, but I don't get a vote. I got to follow. And you do as well. So you can have your questions, you can have your struggles, but don't afford your doubt a courtesy that you're not going to afford your faith. And remember this, doubt your doubts. Is your doubt so compelling that it can't be questioned? And if so, why is that? What happens all too often is that a person is not as critical of their doubts as they need to be. Doubt doesn't typically offer a better solution. You know what doubt does? It nags. That's what doubt does. It's not the standard. You already have a standard. Doubt is a nagger. And it nags at us. And that, like I said, that can be a good thing. Because I believe, especially with our young people, you don't reach a point where you own your faith without going through, through some struggles and maybe having some questions, perhaps some uncertainties. As long as you know how to answer those, right? But doubt is a nagger. And so you deal with the nagging. I'm sure you've encountered individuals who, who claim that there are really no answers, that there's no such thing as absolute truth. You've heard me say my... My rebuttal to that, if there's no such thing as absolute truth as a true statement, then it's false. You know, I mean, that's, that's illogical, right? But there are people who make that claim because they put more of an emphasis on their doubts than they do the standard. I'm telling you to doubt your doubts before you start doubting your faith. For the Christian, the foundational truths of our faith should never be outweighed by doubt. They may pester our doubt. They may nag at our doubt. That, that doubt may be nagging, but they should never win out against our faith. So instead of trying to find a way to confirm your doubt, always seek a way to affirm your truth. Because I think if that's where you start, if you're always seeking to affirm your truth and doubting your doubt, you're going to come to a right conclusion. Doubt your doubts, not your faith. Deal with doubt as it is. It's a nagger. That's it. You know, I'm not a gambler, and I'm not advocating that you gamble this morning, but I think I can make a, a, a relationship here with, with poker. In the game of high-stakes poker, there's a lot of drama. And there is that drama-filled moment when the person holding the cards decides that he's got a winning hand, or at least he believes he does. And so what does he do? He, he stands up, he pushes all his chips to the center of the table, and he says, all in. It's a big move. Turns his cards over, and hopefully he wins. If not, he loses it all, but that's the risk, right? You don't win unless you go all in. And that is absolutely true for the Christian. You've got to be all in. That doesn't mean that you can't have questions or, or like the Father in Mark chapter 9 say, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. As long as you know where to go for the answers, right? As long as you know where to turn. We're always going to have uncertainty. We're always going to have some things that nag at us. But when it comes to the life of a disciple, you've got to push your chips to the center of the table. You've got to say, I'm all in. Kind of like the quote from Lewis Sperry Chafer who said, Believing in Jesus means trusting in Him so much that if He can't get me to heaven, then I ain't going. Folks, if Jesus can't get me to heaven, then I won't be there. You say, well, what's your plan B? I don't have one. 
I don't have a plan B. This is it. Folks, I'm all in. I'm all in on this. And you should be as well. When it comes to the life of a disciple, when it comes to being a follower of Jesus, you've got to be all in. You've got to push your chips to the center of the table and say, there is no plan B. I, I'm here. I'm with you. I'm following you. Even through those moments of uncertainty or whatever, I'm going to allow my doubts to bolster my faith because God is not fragile, and therefore my faith shouldn't be either, right? Let's pray. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for faith for your son who provides it, we thank you so much for all that you have done for us, the evidence that we have in Scripture, the fact that we have a compass, that we have a field manual to get us through this life so that we can make it to heaven. And we pray, God, that this will be a church that is all in. We don't desire to be a country club. We don't desire to be in the entertainment business. We desire to be a church of Christ so that we can seek to do your will so that we can all be in heaven together someday. May we make it our mission to make and grow disciples and to be pleasing to you in all that we do. It's in your son's precious name we pray. Amen. Do you have doubts? Do you have questions? Are you struggling with your faith? Let us help you. And it may not be that you answer the invitation this morning by coming up front. Maybe you need to talk with one of the staff members or one of the elders. That's, that's fine. Maybe... Maybe you are a child of God, and maybe, you've, maybe you're dealing with some doubts. Let us help you. Or maybe you've reached a point in your life where you know you need to do something different spiritually. Let us help you with that as well. Maybe you're ready to study the Bible. Maybe you're, maybe you're ready to take the next step in your faith. Let us help you. The important thing is that all of us understand why we're here. We are here so that we can worship God, so that we can encourage and edify one another, so that we can walk the walk during the week, so that we can prepare for eternity. Be prepared. Come now as we stand and as we sing.